So, a few months ago, ng-conf did a survey, and the number one thing that Angular developers said that both they and other developers are struggling with was RxJS. And when I was first learning RxJS, I thought that the most difficult thing was going to be learning the operators, because there are just so many of them. But once I was familiar with some of them, I realized that I was still having a lot of trouble with RxJS. And, and uh, with talking with my coworkers and trying to figure out what, why it was so difficult, uh, we came to the conclusion that, that it's more about thinking reactively and using those operators to build reactive applications that's so difficult, because it's just different from what we're used to. And about a month ago, or a year ago, sorry, I was working on a tournament app where users could follow different teams and get notified whenever there was a, a win or a loss for the team they're following. And there was a problem where the users were getting notifications when they were supposed to with, uh, with the teams they were already following, but then when they went to a team's page and, and clicked the follow button, they didn't start getting notifications for that uh, team until they refreshed the app. So I figured, all right, I think I know what's going on. I think there's an ng on init somewhere, and in that ng on init, uh, the app is taking the user's teams they're already following and then going through them and subscribing to the notifications so that they can show them to the user. And I thought it would be, um, and, but then in the event handler for the follow team button, there, there was um, a missing line of code there. So I thought what it would look like is something like this. So it would add that new team to the teams that the user's following, and then it would update some visual indicator in the page that they're now following that team. And then that would be it. And I thought that I could just come in and add this line of code, and then it would just work perfectly. So just subscribe to the new notifications for that team. And, uh, but my plan didn't work out, and uh, you'll never guess why. It's because that function didn't exist or it didn't exist in anything close to the form that I was expecting it to. So I saw this instead. I was like, okay. Clicked through to the definition for that observable, and it was just a regular subject. So I'm like, okay. I searched the project and found about 82 references to this subject, and uh, after a couple months, I finally found the right place in the code to change, and then it worked. So to step back for a second and think about that process, I don't think that's actually an uncommon process for a lot of people debugging RxJS applications. I've heard a lot from, from other developers, and, and I've had this experience too, where you feel like you have to chase the observables around um, you know, following the streams around until you find the right place to change stuff. So is it just RxJS? Is that, is that the problem? Is it just difficult to debug RxJS applications? And usually that's kind of my go-to approach, you know, blame the code, like a, a Skinner here. Am I lacking experience? No, it's the observables that are wrong. But actually that wasn't the problem. The problem was my experience. My experience was mostly with imperative architecture. And so I was thinking of it as an imperative app when it was actually structured like a reactive app. And I think that's the key to making it easier for us to understand RxJS apps, apps that are built completely with the reactive architecture. So to look at the difference between imperative and reactive, I think, is the key. So this is what we're mostly used to. The function is. The, the unit that, that determines how things behave. You have event handlers, callbacks that are making things go to the server, making things show up in the DOM, and just making things in general happen in your app. So when you have a bug, you go to, to an event handler or a callback, and you expect to see the problem there. You expect to see something missing there. But with reactive apps, it's, stru it's structured kind of like this. You have sources and sinks in, in a purely reactive app. And in the sources, those are things like DOM events, like when the user types or clicks. And then you have like server events, when data arrives from the server. Um, 
or timers, just anytime data enters your app, that is a source. And then the sync is where data ends up after it goes through your app. So that would be like the DOM where it's shown to the user or um, the server where it's saved. And so these are pretty different architectures if I flip back between these two. So what was happening was I was looking here for an event handler to, to, to uh, uh, have that bug that I could fix. But what I needed to do was actually start from the template and look, find an async pipe for a similar behavior and trace it up there. And if I had done that, I would have found the problem in about one-tenth the time. So our habits are making it more difficult for us to work with RxJS apps. And it's even more difficult when we're trying to write RxJS apps. So I've got this example um, that I made in StackBlitz. I uh, hired a, a PhD graphic designer to help me design this. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, so there's a certain pattern that I see that shows up in a lot of different apps. And my favorite example of this pattern is a simple type ahead or autocomplete, or like a list that you're filtering based on user input. And every time, the first few times most developers come across this pattern, they, they make a mistake and they don't utilize the power that RxJS uh, gives you. So what the, what the type ahead is, is basically you give it input and then it filters the list. Well, that wasn't exciting. It filters the list down to the string that you've typed. And, and then, yeah, so it handles the user input, fetches the data, and then shows it. So how would you just naturally go about coding this, this behavior? Well, the most natural method to every developer I've known is just code it directly. The function takes care of it. The function is in charge. The event handler to this, to this input is right here. So you receive the search term, and then you go fetch the data, and then you show the data by assigning the, the class property to that value. And then change detection takes care of the rest. So how does this work? It works pretty well. Um, but every once in a while, there it goes, um, you get a mismatch between what the user has typed and the results that are showing. You can alleviate this a little bit with debouncing, um, but that's adding some permanent uh, delay time on the request that, that maybe isn't perfect. And it's, it's also a little bit inefficient because once these requests are sent out, they're just out there and they're not being canceled. So what happened here was the second to last request came back after the last request. So it gets shown instead of the last one. And that's where this problem comes from. So how would this look if we were doing this more reactively? Well, um, we would think about the sources and sinks and then the pipes that connect them. And uh, I really, really liked Deborah Carada's talk on, on Wednesday about this, about you know, creating these observable chains that are composed that, that allow you to not even need to manually subscribe. So that's kind of the approach I'm taking here. Uh, so I think about the source first. It's going to be a subject. It could be a behavior subject, whatever. But with this subject, there's an event handler here. We're just going to pump those values into that subject. And that's the source, OK? And then the sync, I'm just going to say it's going to be the async pipe. And it's going to loop through the data and show it here. And so where does this observable come from? This is the hard part. It's, it's the part where you have to think reactively because you have, to, you have to connect the source to the sync. And in this example, it's pretty simple, though. You just chain off of that search term and switch map it into the filtered results. And the result here is uh, it's, it's never going to be out of order. 
I guess just trust me. <laughs> uh, all right, I think that's enough with that. Um, so what are the differences between these two approaches that we can extend to other examples and give ourselves a way to um, avoid the imperative habits that we have with our code? Well, there are some differences here, but I want to call attention to the manual subscription here. Um, the imperative example is calling dot subscribe on that observable chain. And, and looking over a bunch of different examples of RxJS code that was still kind of in an imperative style, this was the common thing between all of them. They were, they were coding with RxJS, but they weren't getting the full advantages. And they were subscribing in either the component class or the service. So theoretically, you shouldn't ever have to manually subscribe, though. I, I like the approach of, of you letting the ASIC pipe handle it all. Because nothing really happens in your app unless a consumer is interested in it, like the user. And nothing is really being calculated unless it's going to be displayed, right? Eventually, the user is going to see it. So it's going to end up in the template. And so if you're, if you're just connecting from the sources to the sinks, and you've got observable chains that are just uh, composing each other all the way down, then that, that subscription that the async pipe is automatically doing for you should just propagate all the way up through your code. And you can have reactive streams and never need to subscribe manually. I'm not saying that you should never, ever subscribe manually. Um, I'm just saying that you should be aware that when you do, you are breaking that observable chain. And from this point on, you are moving over to imperative code. And you might not get the guarantees that reactive code gives you. So I think the one thing I could say is just, of course, it's easier to code imperatively because that's what we're used to. But I think we can actually get better and more comfortable with thinking reactively. And, and so I would say don't, as soon as you get uncomfortable, don't bail yourself out with the subscribe and then do things imperatively. I'd say push yourself a little further and try to think of the reactive solution. And that's how you're going to get better at it. All right. So the last part of my talk is just going to be a lot of opinions that I've developed. I, I, I'm afraid that that we might not get the benefits as a community of, of reactive architecture fully unless we, we really do put in like a, a, an intentional effort at training ourselves and our team members to learn how to use observables in a reactive manner. And I, I'm afraid that there's like the pendulum that's really in favor of ArcGIS right now. It's going to swing the other way. And after a while, if we don't see a ton of benefits from it, we might push it into the corners of our apps and kind of minimize its, its influence in our code. But I don't want that to happen because I really, really love RxJS. I think it's amazing. Um, you remember that tournament app I was talking about at the beginning? That bug um, wasn't real because that bug wouldn't have been able to exist in an app that was actually structured reactively because the notifications would be shown using an async pipe, right? And those notifications would be coming from the observable of notifications, which would be chaining off of the team's observable. And so you wouldn't be able to follow a new team and add it to your teams without that value propagating all the way through. So it would have been impossible for that bug to show up. I think that bugs may seem sometimes like an inevitability in our code, because there are always bugs. But, um, if you're intentional about analyzing the bugs and where they come from, you can actually trace where they come from and eliminate entire categories of bugs. And I think reactive architecture eliminates inconsistent state. And because you can't really develop a new feature unless it's already getting the values from observables, which will be getting the values they need exactly when they need it. So I think it's a better separation of concerns fundamentally. Um, because each, each part of the app is its own authority on what it is, what it means, what it needs, and what it reacts to. 
Whereas with imperative code, you have functions that are determining other parts of the app, how they're going to behave in di at different times. And it's very easy to forget a step. You have to be very active in making the behavior you're looking for happen. I think a good analogy between reactive and imperative architectures is with plumbing, because plumbing is done reactively. Um, but if it were done imperatively, if you needed hot water, there might be like a hose on the wall that you, you grab and you, you uh, spray water into the water heater, you turn on the faucet for hot water, and then you send a text to the utility company. So it's not really surprising that, that maybe if that was how all plumbing was done, that maybe a lot of people would be forgetting a lot of those steps. So a lot of my opinions are just based on my own experience, just being a web developer for the past few years. And I think, um, based on my experience, that reactive architecture is, is scalable for the modern web, whereas imperative isn't. And that might sound like a strong, strong statement, like we would have noticed before now if imperative was impossible. But uh, we actually haven't been doing purely imperative code in a long time. When AngularJS was introduced many years ago, um, it was mostly imperative, but it actually had introduced a slice of reactivity to our apps. And it was exactly that slice of reactivity that developers loved. Change detection was reactive. It could have been called DOM reaction, maybe. And for a while, we did, we did struggle with imperative habits. There were a lot of questions, people saying, how do I manipulate the DOM directly in this circumstance or, or this circumstance? And if you remember, eventually, enough people told us about the Angular way, where you let the variable, you assign the variable, and then you let the DOM react on its own. And I think Redux slash NGRX is kind of uh, continuing that trend as well, except it introduces the layer of reactivity to um, the application state, where reducers react to the events that are happening in your app. I think we are still struggling a little bit with imperative habits with Redux as well, where we create actions that are nothing more than setters of state. But um, yeah, and a really good talk about this is Mike Ryan's talk um, about good action hygiene, I think he gave last year, that covers this concept. So, um, but I think we will, um, we will learn the reactive patterns with Redux as well, I think. And RxJS to me is, is just kind of continuing this trend, but it allows us to introduce reactivity to every layer of our app. And I, I think it's powerful to have one abstraction for asynchronicity that, that you can learn and, and then you're good. You can just always use it. And um, we are struggling with it. There are a lot of imperative habits. It, I mean, it's a lot to adjust to at once with RxJS if you're going to use it everywhere, which I don't recommend doing at first. But I think we will learn the reactive um, habits. And as a result, we will eliminate, we'll just see an entire category of bugs go away. And so I think it'll be worth the struggle, definitely. To summarize the points I wanted to get across in this talk, I think the reason we're struggling right now so much with RxJS is because of our habits that we've just developed with experience programming imperatively. But we can master thinking react reactively if we stick with it and don't bail ourselves out with a manual subscription as soon as we get a little bit fuzzy on what to do next. And lastly, it's going to be worth the struggle. The thing that's exciting to me, I love seeing bugs go away, but the thing that I love most is not having to worry about what parts of the app I have to update or worrying about all the bugs that might come up when I'm creating a new feature. I can just chain off of an existing observable and not even worry about when that observable is going to get the values. I can just trust that it will. So it allows us to develop apps faster and get more exciting features to our users. So that's what I'm excited about. Um, I'm really, really grateful I was able to give this talk. This is my first talk ever. And um, 
I, uh, yeah, thank you all for listening.